And Dante wants to meet and speak to the souls that he meets because there are thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of souls who lives in these circles in this big hall inside the earth. And in the middle of the earth, down at the bottom of the inferno, he finds Lucifer. Hello, Kristin. A warm welcome to the show. Thank you, Janneke. So I'm sitting here in my apartment in Norway and I've invited you to come up here to my apartment to speak about the Inferno of Dante. And you are a best-selling author in Norway. You've written many books. I've interviewed you many times in Norwegian before. And now you came out with this book that has changed your life in many ways and why I thought it was relevant to speak uh, to you about this was because on my channel I focus on pre-birth experiences, near-death experiences and the afterlife and many other things like what actually happens uh, after we die and Dante, he was uh, an Italian writer, lived many hundreds of years ago and then, and it's quite complex, like the material he has written. And then you dive into this and you make your own Norwegian version of it uh, out of a, a material that is so complex. And I meet you six months ago and you were like, this is so exciting. And I'm like, nobody or very few are so enthusiastic about Dante because they don't even understand it. I don't understand it. So I'm very curious about uh, hearing and learning about today how uh, Dante can teach us something about maybe the afterlife or our own shadows and why this is relevant today. So for those who don't know Dante, who was he? Well, uh, <clears throat> Dante Alighieri. He was an author, a poet. Uh, he was born in 1265 and died in 1321. So actually in 2021, it was 700 years since he died. And um, uh, T.S. Eliot, the great poet, says that um, Dante and Shakespeare divide the world between them. There is no third. So, <clears throat> which means that Shakespeare and Dante, uh, they are considered the two columns of the story of European and Western literature. Uh, so Dante, um, he lived in Florence uh, in that period, in the Middle Ages, and he had a fascinating life. Uh, I don't want to go into the details now, but um, he started to write when he was very young and became part of a movement in Florence which wrote in the spoken language in the spoken Italian. And at that time, everything that was printed was only printed in Latin. So he broke through and created something new. And that's why in Italy they call him the father of Italian language, the father of Italian written language. Hmm. So, and then he, he wrote different pieces of text and the most famous is the Divine Comedy, which is a very big uh, and <laughs> huge poem, 5000 verses. And um, this has been uh, living uh, its life through the centuries in our literature and it's divided in three parts. It's a journey through the landscape of the die of the of death, uh, and um, it's divided in three parts. The first third is the journey through Inferno, which is that one that I have now uh, 
mm, rewritten in in a very simple uh, Norwegian language. And then part two is purgatory. And part three is paradise. Uh, many of us do not really know the story of Dante. We probably heard uh, the name and know that it's pretty complex and um, well known, but we actually don't know what it is about and, and why it is so well known. And it's a reason for that. And we're also going to speak about how this has really affected you, like personally, physically in your life. Uh, but could you take us through? The Inferno of Dante. What is happening in this book? Uh, I understand it as Dante is actually the writer, but he himself is the main character. Yes, he's the main character in this journey. And it starts, uh, the start of the poem is very famous because uh, it tells about him. Uh, he's caught in a dark wood cannot find his way out of this dark forest. He's afraid, he's lost, totally lost. This is a symbol of, you know, crisis, difficult periods that everybody has have in life and uh, where we can feel completely lost and we, we don't know what's going to happen. And it's very scary. So he starts in this dark forest and uh, he tries to find his way out. And in that forest, he meets his teacher who will become his guide through the different territories. And so <clears throat> this first territory, which is Inferno, is um, underneath the, uh, the surface of the earth. So get, they go through a little hole in uh, in, uh, in, in, in the stone, you know, in the forest. And then they come uh, underneath and finds a whole enormous um, territory, uh, a hole, like a hole underneath, um, which is uh, divided in uh, different, or nine different circles. And then they walk through these circles one by one. Um, and Dante wants to meet and speak to the souls that he meets on his way because there are thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of soul, souls who lives in these circles uh, in this big hole underneath, inside the earth and in the middle of the earth, down at the bottom of the inferno, <clears throat> uh, he finds Lucifer, Lucifer, the fallen angel that was kicked out of paradise of heaven uh, because he was so arrogant that he wanted to compete with God himself. And he so he has an angel like feature, but he is completely black with black wings and he's enormous and he's sitting representing the darkest part of the human soul down at the bottom. So Dante's journey is, is, is you know, the journey down and to meet Lucifer. So do I understand it correctly that uh, these circles are sort of like this, that they're going down and down, there are different levels and then they, he's journeying through these different levels. So it's actually getting darker and darker, like mm -hmm. the experiences to the souls are getting darker and darker. Yes, and it's a symbol. Uh, this is also a symbol of these tendencies that the human being have, you and me and everyone that can be darker and darker, more and more, um, uh, can you say, more and more evil. And then you come to the really evil part, uh, you know, at the bottom. Well, could you share a little bit about the different levels? So what does he meet first? He meets a lot of souls. Um, what happens? So um, he's, he, uh, before he goes into this uh, 
little hole in the in the in the stone and comes underneath the surface of the ground um he meets Virgil no so Virgil Virgil he's uh, walking together with Dante inside that little hole and the first souls that they meet um are the lazy ones souls that hundreds and thousands and thousands of souls running back and forth um beside a river a river that is called styx uh that's uh the name of the river very famous from mythology where the souls will be transported to the other side of the river to get into the landscape of death and just along uh, just beside the river they run up and down uh and virgil virgil uh the 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 sort of the the guardian spirits yes his guide dante's guide explains to dante that because he says who are these running back and forth like this they seem completely hysterical and he says well uh, they are the lazy ones the ones that behaved in a lazy way uh, when they were on the earth alive because everybody he meets on this long journey they have lived a life on earth and now they are all dead so they that he meets their souls and they have been lazy and uh, what is the punishment uh, or the consequence because i say that dante is not really punishing the souls they have um they undergo a kind of consequence of their own behavior so they were lazy in the sense that they didn't really um, participate in life when they were alive and here they are bitten uh, they run around because they're bit- bitten by big insects that bite them and fly after them continuously so they have to you know relate to this terrible situation they cannot be lazy and um, so there are different symbols here that um, Virgil explains how you know the, the their behavior is connected to the consequence that they live in Inferno uh, do these souls regret uh, what they did? Are they aware that, oh no, I was lazy in my life? Like, does Dante speak to them and get some uh, contact and understanding of why they did what they did? Or is he just perceiving this and they're so, sort of lost forever? Uh, it's very interesting because um, they they are not aware at all uh, about um they were not aware at all now they in in this landscape they some of them are aware that they did something that was not very wise and intelligent but um their main characteristic of all the souls that are in inferno is that they don't admit that they were wrong mm. um they uh they think and they are convinced that anyway they behaved in the right manner so it's it's very subtle so when he speaks because dante wants to know these souls so he meets many 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 souls and interviews them and he wants to understand what happened in their life and they explain to him 
um, what happened, how they behaved. And some of them also really put words to their own behavior, but uh, they don't admit because they never admitted in life that they did something that was not good for them and other people. Hmm. And uh, deep uh, down, uh, that's where we have souls who committed things that they actually did consciously and they do not regret it, right? Yes. The difference between the first um, circles and the lowest circles is that the upper circles, they uh, there are souls that really behaved in a very spontaneous way and did things in their life and made choices in their life that was sort of unconscious. They just slipped into bad behavior and and they sort of they didn't know uh, before it was too late, but they never regretted what they did. And the lower circles um, uh, there are in the lower circles are souls that uh, knew perfectly well what they did and they did it on purpose. So their behavior is completely conscious. I know that I'm doing something that will hurt someone or myself, but the gain of it is so strong that I'm doing it anyway. Hmm. So you see, there is a difference. And um, none of these, neither the souls in the upper level or the lower level, level have, uh, you know, asked for mercy or really gone into uh, uh, self-conscious uh, 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 reflection reflection or you know asked for forgiveness mm. so it's not in their character to and it was not in their character and still it's not in their character while they are in inferno to to say i'm sorry to ask for forgiveness or to reflect upon their own behavior and uh, so it's it's when Dante meets these people, they uh, it's it's sort of the reader's reflection together with Dante, and first of all, it's his guide, Virgil, who actually explains what I'm telling you now. Mm. You know, uh, gives an explanation about okay, so this you here you meet this. Do you want to speak with that one? Yes. He's behaving like this and so Virgil is helping him to understand and do his own reflection. Hmm. And on a symbolic level, this is Dante's own reflection journey. So he meets all his soul, but what I perceive of this big text is that it's a growth for himself so that these souls mirror different tendencies that he himself as a human being has. Okay, when he meets the lazy, for instance, he is reflect, they are reflecting back his own tendency to be lazy and to not care about this and this and this and this. So in a way, it's his own, all these souls mirror back something of himself. And what is interesting is that he's changing behavior while he's walking down mm. and then up again, Purgatory Mountain, which has another kind of character and content. Uh, he is changing mm. and I think that um, when you come into this text 
you start to it starts to as this is my experience start start starts to change you as a reader yeah because i i wanted to um uh or or to understand this material, I think it's important also to include the other uh, parts, uh, the purgatory and, and paradise. So purgatory, uh, I know you've looked at that a little bit uh, as well uh, from Dante's writing. That's souls who are regretting, uh, correct? Yeah, and in paradise, that's where, of course, paradise, we know what paradise is. Uh, so would you say that part of it is a metaphor or sort of an explanation of what might happen to us when we die? Like I'm thinking about Bardo and the Egyptian understanding of what happens when we die, that they really prepared for death. They knew they were going to go through stages. Uh, now, I don't really believe in hell and purgatory, but I do believe that we can create sort of a hell for ourselves. Uh, which is symbolic, uh, but you probably reflected about this. And uh, I, I think that many, many could have understood it as, oh, that's what happens when we die. Uh, what do you think? Personally, I've written books about, you know, inner development, self-development and what is consciousness and, and all these topics for years. So I, of course, I have these glasses in front of me. So for me personally, it's not uh, um, a poem about what happens after we, we die. But I, I have complete respect for the people who reads this. And for instance, in a Christian context, that can have this kind of understanding of the poem. For me, it's much more interesting to um, read this in an in a way that I that where I can relate this to my own life today and what it means to be stuck for instance in hell because the souls that are stuck in hell they don't they don't get out because they are so hard-headed and they are stuck with their own you know mindset and they they don't they don't move mm. because they're stuck in there and they're stuck in their own tendencies in their own behavior, bad behavior, and they don't want to look at themselves. They don't want to challenge themselves. They think they are right. Basta. So uh, then you get stuck. And where do you get stuck? You get stuck in a sort of hellish life. Mm. Hell on earth. Yeah. Mm. Hell on earth. Uh, and you, you, you complain all the time, but you don't want to change. You continue to complain and everything is bad and everything is bad and you repeat this and this is, you know, a sign that you are stuck, that you don't want to move further. But to move further, as Dante says, you have to be willing to challenge yourself and look at these uh, tendencies, which are actually our shadows, as Carl Gustav Jung said we all have shadows some have more some have less and dante is teaching me that uh, we have to become aware more aware and we can actually study them to get free aware of our shadows aware of our shadows to become free from them because when light comes in we know that from the Norwegian fairy tales, we have the trolls, you know, and the trolls, where do they live? They live inside the mountains in the darkness. But when the trolls get outside in the sunlight, you know, they get destroyed. They, they melt or crack or they crack <laughs> open or they whatever. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's uh, the, the ending point of the troll. So that means when, when you, you put these uh, tendencies out in the light, uh, my tendencies out in the light, become conscious of them, they can actually start to melt. And that's the 
process of maturity. So what, what Dante teaches me specifically uh, in this part, which is Inferno, uh, uh, is what are the tendencies that are inside all human beings? Can I get more conscious about these tendencies? Can I look at how I am behaving in a lazy way? Is that good for me? No, it's not. It's not um, uh, Virgi Virgil. His guide says that you, Dante, you are given a life by, you know, the divine or whatever you call it. Uh, you're given a life and how you use it is your choice. If you want to use it in a beautiful way or you want to follow your shadows or your dark sides, that's your choice. No judgment? No, in a sense, it's my responsibility. So it comes down to a responsibility and the consequences uh, of a certain behavior mm. uh, is also a kind of responsibility, mm. you know. So it's it's not judgment in the classical sense. Uh, that's why I think that all these souls have a kind of punishment, but it's not Dante never uses this word punishment. He uses a very special word uh, in Italian, it's called contrapasso, which means a, a sort of consequence of your own behavior. If I should translate it to my daily life, it would be that if I say yes to my dark tendencies, to my shadows here in this life, I will have a consequence it will have a consequence in my life. Mm. So, you know, it's, 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 it can be subtle. But what is interesting uh, with this work is that you can actually use it as a, a study project to study yourself and to grow. And this was completely unexpected to me. Ah, uh, to you when you read the material. Yeah, completely yeah. unexpected. I, I just had a thought. Now, I again, I haven't written or read uh, the other parts, so just uh, read a little bit of, of your book, which is brilliant, by the way, and it's pretty deep. So I'm reading it carefully and slowly. Uh, but it seems like there is a roadmap here to personal development. It seems like it's a long course in sort of how to meet yourself, how to self-develop, how to grow, uh, because the end is the paradise, right? So it seems like the more we're aware of our shadows, like uh, the first part, we're not aware of our shadows, and then we become more aware, like in purgatory, and then we come to paradise. <laughs> yeah, it's true. This is how I understand it. Mm. But what is fascinating with uh, the work of Dante, is that it can be uh, re perceived, received in many ways, mm. because he never made any comment on this. For 700 years, we have an enormous material in the literature of comments. So what we have today is his original text, which is actually a story with uh, that a story full of symbols, a story full of images, a story that is dramatic and it's subtle and it's it has so many levels and it has many levels of understanding. And in Italy, where they know this very well, since, you know, since he wrote it, um, there are groups that can, that understand it in an academic way, mm. in a historical way, then they interpret the historical details. Then there is another group that are that's fascinated by the mythology 
and uh, the you know um, the references to the Bible, for instance. Mm. And there's another group that is you know more interested in the esoteric part of it. Mm. It's very deep uh, esoteric tradition around Dante's work, mm. especially in Florence where he lived. Mm. So uh, you can put on different glasses, mm. you know, and, and look at this text and something will come back to you. So and that's the magic part of it. I never thought that a piece of classical literature that is normally perceived as, you know, as a piece of classical literature could have this kind of impact Yes, that part I found very interesting. I always love transformational stories. And I know there was a, a time in your life where you uh, had an accident and you hurt your arm. And this Dante book <laughs> magically sort of appeared uh, in your uh, home or like it was there, but it was sort of a coincidence that you started reading it and it actually changed you. So could you share that story? Yes, I would love to. Um, I am half Italian. So my mother is was uh, Italian and my grandparents also were Italians. And but I was brought up in Norway um, and I had this terrible ski accident in the Alps in, two, in 2011. And I had a surgery, I, I, my arm broke, my shoulder broke, I didn't know. The whole arm was just, you know, all bandaged and after the surgery and everything. And I had terrible, terrible weeks and months after this accident. And uh, one night, maybe a couple of months after the accident, I woke up one night with an impulse uh, and I went out in my living room and picked a book out of the bookshelf in the dark. I couldn't see what book it was and I just went back to bed and put the light on, opened the book and uh, I saw it was Dante Alighieri's Inferno. And this was a book that I had got as a present from my grandfather, uh, Italian grandfather, and it was full of, you know, um, small drawings and words and notes that he had done. And I thought, what am I going to do now? I feel so terrible. And why this book is the most difficult book I have in my bookshelf. And then came another voice sort of in my head, another thought that said, but maybe you're going to learn about how it is to survive in Inferno, because you're actually living in a kind of state of fear and panic uh, about your life, and you don't know where it's going to lead. I must just uh, add that, uh, Kristin, you're a famous writer uh, in Norway and you've written so many books. And of course, when you can't use your arm. And it was my right, right. arm, my writing arm. I'm a freelancer. Mm. It was my working tool also. Mm. That's right. So, so, and, but then this situation was so curious and bizarre. And I, I was actually quite, I had a, a kind of wake, awake moment uh, where I thought, okay, let me just have a look. Is there something for me? Is Dante coming, telling me something important in this moment of big crisis? And I knew just a little bit about this poem, but it, I had tried to read it because my mother was very much fascinated by it. And my grandfather was, <clears throat> but I didn't know anything really about it. 
So I started to wanting to understand what was this story about. And I started to read and the, the complexity of this very difficult text. Uh, the reason of the complexity is that you have to read the footnotes uh, while you read the verses to get a real understanding. And the footnotes are the comments that writers and commentary, uh, you know, uh, that has been written for centuries and that explain the details inside each verse. So I started to, you know, with, with this very kind of study approach, a student approach, I started to see more of the richness and the details inside this journey. And I, I was sort of drawn into it slowly, step by step. I saw a little bit more, a little bit more, and the images came. I could relate to this, uh, you know, the journey inside, inside the earth. And I thought there was something really fascinating about this. Uh, so after a while, I think it was maybe three, four months, uh, I said, this, this is so fascinating, I want to remember. But I cannot write, I cannot take notes because my arm did not function. So I said, okay, I have to find a way to take notes where it goes really slowly. And I thought maybe I should just play with it. And uh, I was very fascinated by Dante's own rhyme. He, in his original, in Italian, there is rhythm and rhyme in the language. Rhythm and rhymes pulls you in, in a different way than prose. So I was pulled into the story also by the rhythm and the rhyme. So I thought, okay, I'll just play with it, with rhythm and rhyme in Norwegian. And I thought that was a real challenge. Uh, but I couldn't tell anyone. So I started to rewrite the story in rhythm and rhyme in Norwegian and I couldn't stop. So after my shoulder was, you know, uh, recuperated again and it started working again and I could write in a normal way, I continued to work with this text and it took me about 10 years to finish uh, the text completely. Yeah, it's, it's a brilliant um, amount of work you've done. Uh, and tell us a little bit about how it changed you emotionally and physically. Well, uh, what I detected and noticed uh, was that just a few months uh, after I started, I really psychologically I started to feel better. I had more access to my vitality. I was not so much closed into fear and uh, depression. And it was like some kind of light came into my life, hope, and that I could uh, still dive into and be enthusiastic about a project that was only mine and that uh, I had no plans to publish or anything. It was a kind of um, project, very secret, intimate project that I had with myself and where I had. And I understood also that it became almost like a meditation practice or a writing practice an inner practice where I was in my chamber um, daily or almost every day for maybe one hour or two. And I had this relationship with Dante in my little secret chamber. And it was very holy. It became 
a kind of holy secret place for me of intimacy and knowledge and growth and I just love to be there I it, it changed it really changed my my not only during uh, my you know difficult period with my arm but this quality of being in that sacred place with something that was only mine gave me a certain kind of joy and satisfaction and um, also a, a feeling of really gratefulness to having been shown the depth and the and the richness of this uh, poem but did you understand yourself better when reading the yes, poem yes absolutely because every time that i met and i i went with dante and virgil down there and every time i met uh, one of the characters that he interviewed, I started my own reflection about my own, for instance, um, greediness when he meets the the uh, in the level of the greedy souls. I started to reflect on greediness, where I saw my own greediness in my life, where I could detect greediness around me, and. You know, uh, it, it sort of opened the different, um, yeah, the different sins, as we call them in Christian language, the seven sins. And shadows in the spiritual language. Yeah. And shadows <laughs> in the spiritual language, mm. uh, which makes it so much more relevant to our own and, and not so fearful. Mm. So we can actually have the courage to look at them and that there are different levels of greediness of course mm. and sometimes they get uh, yeah like shadows they you don't see them because they're in the shadow mm. they get invisible but do you think that uh, the reason why the light came into your life you got more hope because you you were in a panicked state uh, what am I going to do you know I need my arm I, I can't write uh, what am I going to live uh, by doing uh, that when you went through your shadows that the light came in because you started seeing them and you started em accepting them I think it's a process that still goes on because um, I started in, two, in in 2011. Now we are in 2024 and this whole text is still alive within me. Mm. And uh, these characters from Inferno, they come back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this character, sometimes that character. And now since I published the book, I'm traveling around, I'm giving talks, I'm doing performances with music, I'm doing so many things with this material, so the material is still alive mm. in me. So it's a constant reminder mm. about um, where, where is my path and watch out so I don't slide into uh, the the shadows, the darker parts, and I also see it outside in my in society how easy it is to get drawn into these shadows if we are not aware, and most people are not very much aware of these tendency that we all have. Sometimes we. Uh, we, we, you know, we, it's, a, it's a cultural aspect. Sometimes it's a character that is linked to our upbringing, to our family. Mm. And the whole work of becoming aware of your own behavior is so much linked to your spiritual growth mm. to become free, actually. Mm. Free from the ego pattern, free from these shadows so that you can become more authentic and true and um, also 
let um, let the best parts of the human being become manifest. Mm. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, the souls that Dante finds in paradise. Uh, those are the souls that had the capacity in life to manifest the most beautiful parts of the human being, mm. you know, love, uh, friendliness, tolerance, mm. uh, all, all the most beautiful parts. And we all have them, mm. but there are shadows inside us that uh, we have to work our way through. Mm. And uh, in the book or the, the poem, the long poem, uh, Dante actually shows a way to do that when he meets these animals, like right at the beginning. Could you share a little bit about that? Yes. Um, the first part of the story of Inferno is very famous, especially in Italy. If you ask someone in the street, can you please, you know, uh, tell me, about uh, Dante's Inferno or Dante's work or the Divine Comedy. Everybody will know because they they got it in, in, uh, in their education in school. And so the journey starts in this dark forest and on the way um, <clears throat> through this forest, he, the, after a very short while, he meets these three wild animals. Uh, they represent, they are symbols uh, that's trying, uh, they are trying to stop him to go forward and to get out of this darkness. And the first animal is a leopard, uh, a cat-like uh, wild animal uh, full of patches. And... Um, that's the first one and he gets really scared because he cannot pass this animal and then right after uh, a, a huge lion comes out of the forest and stands in front of him and also threaten him the same way and he gets so scared and right after that comes a third uh, wild animal a wolf and the lion represents the um, urge for power and uh, for uh, arrogance and feeling better, the feeling better than other people, wanting to, you know, have a, a power position in, you know, uh, with other people. And the wolf is the symbol of greediness the greediness that we all have that is a kind of hunger that never gets uh, relaxed uh, or satisfied mm. so these are symbols for our tendencies mm. so in a sense in the first song or chapter because there are 34 chapters in Inferno. He calls them songs because there is rhythm and rhyme. Um, he can sort of, um, in these fur three animals, you find the condensed symbols of many of the other tendencies that you find uh, down in Inferno in the meetings with the souls that are down there. And uh, so Virgil, uh, his guide, he, he explains to Dante that you cannot, you cannot get past these animals uh, by yourself. This, you, you, they just have power over you. And you have to learn more about these tendencies to get past them to get through them, to become more mature so that you can find your way to God, to the light, to the divine in paradise. 
Uh, so the wisdom here is that you cannot fight it. You cannot run away from it. You have to learn more about it. Yeah. You have mm. to learn more about it. You have to relate it to your own life mm. and digest it. Mm. Uh, you have to see it outside. You have to see it inside. And when you do that, you sort of work with it. It becomes conscious and then you can navigate in your life with this wisdom and you know where better, where to step forward, where not to step forward because life is about um, <laughs> crossroads all the time mm -hmm. and your choice and the responsibility you have for each choice you take. Hmm. Wow, uh, Dante was a wise man and to ask if it's relevant today, I feel is a stupid question. <laughs> it feels so relevant and uh, amazing that you have brought this forward uh, and make made it so much accessible, especially for Norwegians and hopefully some of you guys all also were inspired to check it out uh, in your language. Um, is there something you would like to say at the end? Like, what was your biggest insight from this material? First of all, I want to say something about what you just said now, mm -hmm. uh, because I I did this uh, rewritten, I rewrote the story as a bridge to the original, uh, because I really want to underline that the original is Dante. Uh, it's long, it's complex, and uh, I would be so happy if this could inspire, uh, you know, a reader to go forward and really go into the original mm. stuff. I'm making a light version just to inspire you so that you can work with Dante's own text or uh, the translation of his own text. But it's only Norwegian, right? This is only in Norwegian now. Mm. But you can also find it easier. I mean, in English, I know mm -hmm. there has been publications that are easier mm. versions of Dante that you can start with mm. just to have an idea. What is this about? And then take step by step further and go into his original uh, yeah, mm. after that. So your biggest insight, like one thing from Dante that just uh, that just were awe inspiring. Uh, the biggest insight, I think, is that this is a text that is just more than a text. Uh, I have been curious about this. Uh, with text since I'm a writer. What does a text do with you? How does text interfere in your own life? And I know that especially sacred texts like the Bible or Bhagavad Gita in India or certain sacred texts have something more than only the words and the images and the uh, and the message they have a quality of something more and like an energy or a force or i don't know a, a, a kind of frequency oh. hmm. that is transmitted mm. uh, and i i have become very much aware the last 10 15 years mm. that certain texts has a very subtle frequency so that when i read the text, I also drink something else together with the text. So I think this is my personal uh, impression, but one of the insights for me personally, that was maybe the most surprising, was that this text that I thought was an intellectual, academic, historical, literary text, for me is actually much, much more than that. Hmm. 
and that I can drink a little bit of it uh, in my daily practice and uh, yeah and really enjoy that kind of nourishment that's a beautiful thing this has been so uh, interesting to learn about uh, Christian thank you so much for putting it out there for more people to uh, discover and I have three questions that I ask all my guests and the first one is what is self-love to you Self-love uh, is really uh, a matter of taking care of me, of my own life, my thoughts, my emotion and my body and my intellect so that I really nourish the different parts of myself. Um, this is self-love and self-respect because I was given this life, as Virgil says to Dante. And it's my body, is my temple. That's where my soul lives. And my intellect is something that I have worked with through, through my life. I'm invested in it. And my emotions, they give me a dimension that is beautiful in my life. And all of these parts I need to take care of with love and with respect. Mm. So that's uh, my uh, answer to you. Such a beautiful answer. Uh, what is happiness to you? Happiness is, um, there are different levels of happiness. Uh, I think that happiness can be, uh, you know, spontaneous and uh, glimpses and connected to situations and relations and you know specific separate things then uh, I feel that there is another I perceive that there is another level of happiness is more like an current that lies underneath the surface that you can get in touch with that is not so out uh, spoken. It's not so expressive. It's more a happiness that is a kind of uh, ground that you uh, step on and that you navigate in. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of more a silent kind of happiness and this kind of happiness is something that other people will detect without really knowing what it is mm. and it's somebody if you meet someone that has this happiness in their background or in their you know ground um, system you will get something of it because it's contagious. Mm -hmm. So that's another kind of happiness. <laughs> Lovely. And the biggest one of them all, what is the deeper meaning of life from your perspective? Meaning is a very, very interesting word. And to have a relationship with this word, I think it's a base, the basis of having good health, inner health. Now they have, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much fascinated by Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychologist, a uh, psych, uh, psych uh, doctor, um, and he wrote a lot about meaning and the matter, how important it is to have the sensation of meaning. But I think meaning is more an experience than an intellectual explainable idea in the sense that we can have these experiences that we just feel that this makes sense to me. It's just a, a, a you, you perceive it, you can feel it in your whole system that 
this makes sense. Yes, it has a meaning. It makes sense. Everything comes together. I have an insight. It makes so much sense. This is an experience. It's not an idea. And this is what I believe is important because there is a vitality and there is a sense of being alive. Mm. And the sense of really being alive now, present in this moment, because we only have this moment, this is the true, for me, is the truest interpretation maybe or explanation of meaning. Mm. That was very nice. I was just thinking about when you said we only have this moment and I'm thinking I'm sharing this moment with you and we have all our lives behind us uh, and a life ahead of us. But in this moment, we are the most important for each other because we're only in this moment together. <laughs> like this is what existing right now. And that's quite holy. <laughs> yes, it is very holy because we cannot go to the past. Now we can go to the images of the past. Mm. We cannot go to the future. Mm. It's just some images we have in our head. Mm. So where can we be? We can just be here, you and me in this moment. Mm. It is holy. And uh, I was basically uh, wrapping up this interview, but I just remember you told me about this mystical experience in a Norwegian interview many years ago, and you were in a theater. And I, I just would love for you guys to, to hear it as well. So would you like to share it? Yes, it's fine. Um, it was before I really started to uh, meditate and started my inner journey. And I was uh, invited by a friend of mine uh, to a theater play in Oslo, in the center of Oslo, in a sort of avant-garde theater. It's called Black Box. And uh, I thought also about this name later on, because when the light switched off and the seconds before the actors came on stage, a sort of the whole theater opened up into something completely new and I everything was black but it was so rich like black velvet like a little bit like universe and inside this black space I just I didn't hear I, I just perceived everything said inside me that everything happens right now. And I thought it was a very strange thing. And then I, I, I sat with this unexplainable kind of insight. I didn't understand it. And then the, the, the theater play started and it sort of, you know, my mind came into other things. But in the evening and the day after, I had this experience in my body and in my mind about, about this sentence, everything happens now. So I... I slowly, 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 I started to unwrap it. And when I started to <clears throat> journey in my inner landscape, slowly, step by step, I understood the depth of it. And uh, I saw that it was a kind of um, truth that just broke through with all its power in that moment. Wow. So, you know, all our history, everything that has happened in the past is actually happening right now and the future is happening right now. It's mind blowing, right? It is. It is. <laughs> it's too big for our little mind to understand, but we can touch it and it makes us alive in a certain way when we, you know, go close to it and uh, 
open. I'm go and open up for it. Yeah, open up for the mysteries. I think that makes uh, life more magical. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Christian, for being here today and for again writing this amazing material. Thank you to you, Janneke, for inviting me. Mm.